Okay, let's begin. Let's call to order the Planning Commission meeting, September 8th, 6.03 p.m. We have a quorum, and let's start off by um, having the opportunity to review and modify the agenda or ask any questions about it or anything. Is everyone good with it? Any changes that need to be made? Speak up. Okay, if something comes to you, you can jump in about it, but let's move on to um, uh, approving the, or discussing the August 2nd minutes of our last meeting. We can start with a motion, a second, and then discussion to move it along. I move their approval. Okay. I second. Gary seconds. Any discussion, any edits? I'll give a few seconds. But... Okay. Um, roll call vote. Start with Prudence. Yes. Kate. Yes. Dan. Yes. Gary. Aye. Tom, aye as well. Okay, um, now on to announcements. Do any of the commissioners have any announcements? Anything quick or events or notes that aren't on the agenda uh, or whatever you define as an announcement? Sue usually does. Okay, Sue, you wanna, if you have any, go ahead. Yeah, I just have two. Um, I'll put this under announcements, but I did get an email from Doran, um, and he was likely not able to make it tonight. He had some things going on, so he sent his regrets. Um, but I have been working with him um, on some of the housing study stuff, so that, that's been helpful. Um, and the other announcement that I wanted to make is that on September 21st at the select board meeting, so those start at 6.15, um, Vermont VTrans is going to be holding a presentation. They call it an alternatives presentation. They have been looking at the bridge at Melrose Street. So it's on Western Avenue, right? If you're going west, it's just past Melrose Street. Um, they're looking at a replacement of that bridge. So they're doing an alternatives presentation at that meeting. Um, that bridge has been discussed for years, um, both locally and regionally as needing replacement because it's an undersized bridge that is in this odd angle, causes flooding um, in West Brattleboro. Um, in Irene, it certainly did. Um, and uh, there's also bike and pedestrian problems with the current, um, it's just very narrow. So bicyclists can't really you know, they, they take up the entire lane, which might work if drivers were um, respectful of that. Um, so anyway, there, there might be some interest um, from planning commissioners. So I just wanted to let you know about that alternatives presentation at the select board meeting. And that's the 21st, so? Yep. Is that gonna be prior or during or I? I... It's gonna be during the select board meeting. Oh, okay. And Mel, that one near Melrose, I'm trying to remember that bridge. Uh, it's, on, it's, it's on Route 9, you said? Mm -hmm. It's on Route 9, yeah. um, kind of at the entrance to West Brattleboro Village. You cross over the Whetstone Brook. Yeah. Oh, we're going to. Right uh, by those Brookside condos. It's a little bit past. It's, it's actually a further. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's a big. Big concern for cars coming in at an angle and bicyclists because it's narrow. I'm gonna check I'm gonna do a site survey. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a couple points. Um, I hope you all got the, yeah. and I think uh, staff did a little blurb for us, which was nice. Um, I deferred writing it. And so you guys, I think you guys did a really good summary of what we've been up to the last quarter. And there was a bit about Hurricane Irene, too. Maybe you saw that, Dan. Um, I thought, too, it might be good to... Uh, I remember when I first signed on to the Planning Commission, I got a list of all the members with their contact info. I don't know if you guys are doing that for new members as they come on, but I don't know if that would be an email or a piece of paper printed to all of us. But that could be... Obviously, we have each other's emails. And we don't necessarily need each other's addresses. I don't know, but I guess just phone numbers can be handy sometimes. 
Would you like a picture too? We can, <laughs> I would say, what, what do you think? Do a picture of a and favorite color to match the name? Yeah. Oh, maybe. <laughs> I'm gonna be... take pictures of these little screenshots. Yeah. <laughs> Out there in the field. <laughs> but maybe I'll just put that right on the Google Drive. Well, I don't know if the public wants that. Yeah, just an email amongst all of us, I think, with phone numbers. I think that'd be good. Oh, only why I said the pictures, Tom. Yo, it yeah. It kind of makes it look more livable. I guess you can say seeing people involved and then them out there doing it and oh, showing them out. Are you saying on the web page? Yeah. Oh, I just mean amongst ourselves. Oh, amongst so ourselves. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, that would be great. I mean, yeah. I could, you know, probably pull up a few of myself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, maybe some people's preferences may be email, Hi. but hey there. Hey. Are you Steve, there? back door is supposed to be unlocked. Back door of the building? Yeah. Uh, it is for now. Yeah. Because it's locked right now. Oh, is it? It's locked right now. Okay. Um, I will take care of that. Okay. Sorry to disturb. That's okay. that's fine. Yeah. yeah so, so that wasn't so much an announcement, but it was just maybe a request of Stu, Steve, uh, Sue or Steve. But I thought, <clears throat> I don't know if anyone didn't want to share their phone number with the rest of us that could speak up. <laughs> kind of an odd time. Um, put you on the spot, maybe. Well, um, I, I I just have a question about that. I. I you know, I really don't have a problem with it, but uh, there is this issue. Uh, well, there are there could be some issues about communicating about topics, and we probably just should just um, make sure that we're not kind of, I don't know, uh, uh, overstepping any boundaries with if if we were, uh, you know, on the telephone and all that kind of thing. I, I've I've talked with Gary, for example. I've, I'm kind of you know we're both careful about trying not to, you know. Go to oh, into things, you know. Yeah. yeah. Just as a just as a note, if we were to all have each other's phones, it's not a big deal. But um, that we should maybe make make a point of mentioning it if we uh, if we're doing it frequently, you know. Mm -hmm. We're using the, the phone, uh, other than you know, oh, I'm not going to be at the meeting or something like that, some sort of indication. Right. Yeah, I remember we got this um, when I signed up. When I first became a commissioner, I got this list of form. Okay. Yeah, and it has st it has staff on it too. You know, so some of those are out of date in, in both categories. So. Yeah, I think that got lost in the COVID, uh, in the weird COVID year, <laughs> and not. Yeah, I mean, it's people, not too important, but yes, right? we, we can, can easily just. We can yeah, do so, that. Yeah, we can easily email whenever we want somebody's phone number, but you know. Anyway, a minor thing. This is something, it's sort of like the RTM, yeah. in a way to have like the town uh, information. Yeah, but I that's mean, just internal, it's, you know, it's not for oh, the public to see. Oh, okay, for this. Yeah. Right. Um, that's <clears throat> that's it for me. Anything else? Any announcements? Okay. Uh, question. Yeah. Now, they have that big event coming down, coming, there's quite a few coming up. Is there anything that... Planning Commission is going to be a part of. There's a lot of big events too, or coming downtown down the pipeline. Are we going to be doing any more surveys, anything big like that? Like that other one was awesome, the one that I and I appreciate that too with the housing. Uh, are we having anything else coming? Um, there is nothing that the Planning Commission. There are no surveys that I was anticipating for the planning commission, but you know, something like that, you know, if something comes up, we could certainly do some surveying. Um, I'm not sure what you mean about big events that the planning commission will be at. Um, I'd need more information about that. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I was just, because now we have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, what was it, that big event they're having there, the 25th for the food thing. Oh, that, that got canceled, I believe. It did. The, the staff and vote and. Oh, no, no, not the, not the staff picnic. I oh. It was more like in line, like they're having that big food festival downtown and, you know, having surveys that, about. Yeah, I don't know that that food festival is downtown. I thought that was in Demerson. It is. It's at uh, Campfires. It's the Whetstone puts on the, it's oh. like the New England Brewery Fest. We're actually. Um, the collective, oh, well, there's, there's a bunch of like local people participating in it. Um, it's on the 25th, Saturday, oh, September. Okay. I think if that's what you're, I think what you're talking about. 
I was looking at this also with that thing with the with the uh, the surveys that you do also with the bike. I think it was with B train. Are we having any other surveys with them in regards to the uh, biking issues downtown and along the, the roads? Anything else coming up? Any other survey? Other than, I could know we did the housing, but I don't know if we have any other important. I know of one other survey that the planning department is planning on, and that is about the website. Uh, but I can't give you a timeline on it. It'll probably right. be by the end of this month. Um, okay. It was BCAP that did, did some bicycling surveying and you know that could depend on what we do for a municipal planning grant. Oh, okay, I did that one. Okay, I guess that's it. Look for our survey. Yeah, okay. okay. We're six minutes ahead. Let's take a recess. <laughs> a couple of you thought I was serious. Um, okay, on to the um, the solar subcommittee update. Uh, Doran and I are both on that. Um, I think at the last meeting I gave a little update saying that we thought that our August 23rd meeting would be the final one, or we aspired for it to be. Um, some of you are, are uh, new um, to the commission uh, relative to the fact that in January we um, formed the solar subcommittee, solar siting subcommittee. And um, in the minutes, I had to look back, but it states that we um, planned on having an August end date. Um, there's no, no penalty attached to it or anything, but, but that, was the, uh, that was the goal. But at the August 23rd subcommittee meeting, we just couldn't we couldn't wrap up and come to an agreement um, and with a final product. So we were hoping to, well, to unofficially or officially request from the planning commission a, um, that we need a, that the subcommittee needs an extension. Um, maybe at the, so our next meeting is September 27th. Um, so once again, we had this draft that we were bouncing around for a few months and it wasn't, it wasn't really a, working the format or the approach for, for a good amount of the people. So then um, draft uh, staff um, kind of revised it and did more of a, um, took it more from being like black and white and sort of like ordinancy to, um, to more guidance and question prompt format about, you know, um, solar site and getting the preferred incentive or not. Um, so yeah, we may, no promises, but we may finish up at the next meeting, September 27th is I think the general consensus. But um, I guess what I'm looking for as part of the subcommittee as well is to see if the, uh, I, I don't know if legally we have to do this or anything, but just to cover everything, um, you know, and just, just to be thorough, I think uh, it'd be nice to get um, approval from the planning commission to extend the, um, the life of the subcommittee. I don't know how urgent people are feeling to get that done. We could say, you know, one more, one more month, you know, to the end of September, or we could say indefinitely and just scouts honor, we'll, we'll get it done quickly, as quick as we can. Mm -hmm. What do people think, or does staff want to chime in? And there's Ralph, he's on the subcommittee too, but Dan, go uh, ahead. Um, was there a, when you set it up in, uh, earlier this year was there a time frame i'm sorry if i missed that but yeah well yeah it, you know it wasn't um people weren't weren't beating the the war drum to say august is the end date i don't know if i'm using that metaphor correctly but um but it did say in the minutes um with a um an intended end of to finish the work in august so it was intended so, not like a deadline or you know right yeah. yeah there's no we're not missing out on anything really we're not we're not you know, running a foul, we're not missing an opportunity, really. So it's not like there's solar developers coming, you know, as you guys know, we don't have any on our agenda and we haven't. So it's not like they're, they're storming the gates. Um, but, but I don't think, um, well, I don't know, I can only speak for myself, but I was kind of looking forward to wrapping up in August. So, I mean, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't say this is my, my, you know, subcommittee is a, a great passion or hobby of mine and I want it to continue for years. So I, I think, you know, I, I can't only speak for myself, but I, you know, I think we have the interest of wrapping it up mm -hmm. as fast as we can, but we want to come up with a pretty decent product 
to recommend to the planning commission. So hopefully that's next meeting. So you're looking at an end game and from after that, it's gonna to go to the next phase or this is just the final? It's a document. And so it was on the Google Drive folder. I shared the, uh, the draft we were bouncing around for a few months and then kind of got away from, and then a draft of a new document that has a, a July date in it. And um, even though we are considering that in August and, uh, and that's probably more along the lines of what it will look like. And we'll, we'll give it to the plant, to us, the planning commission and hope that, um, and recommend that the planning commission ad adopts it or uses it going forward. Yeah. Any questions or a motion? I don't know. I mean, I remember I bounced this idea around with one of us, maybe Stephen Dotson or with you, Sue. And I think maybe all were saying that maybe it doesn't require a motion or anything, but I mean, are people fine with with just hearing that update and then? Yeah, I'm good with just hearing the update. I mean, you pretty much summarize where you're at. You know, it's good to know and what your uh, your view is on it, and when you see yourself pretty much uh, fulfilling the project and the end product of it, and then uh, you guys can determine that if it's already been pretty much to your satisfaction and just presented. Yep. Just like, like about a month, you think maybe just just a ball. If if we can finish it at the September twenty seventh meeting, then okay. Yeah, yeah. A couple of members are are you know expressly going to be doing some work, some specific work in between now and then if they haven't already, and um, and are going to uh, so that will help. Yeah, that'll help get us there instead of trying to flesh things out at the meetings mainly. Um. So yeah. Uh, what, Ralph? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, if you want to say anything, Ralph, but it's it's fine just to be there to uh, to listen in. That's good. But yeah, you're you're our guest, so I, I'm yes, good. Thank you. I'm. I just thought I would uh, drop in to see what uh, took place, but I have nothing to add. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, sure. Yeah, just another thing. The the document has um you know, a good outline of the preferred solar siting um, situation and, um, you know, the, the municipal's role, municipality's role and the planning commission's role and the state through section 248, um, their role sort of, and also just other preferred, um, the automatic preferred siting. And then it has a, a whole bunch of question prompts and a lot of categories like land use and historic resource and um, complying with the land use regs and, um, natural resources, but they're all kind of prompts to guide uh, the planning commission's thought process instead of like strict black and white, yes or no, does this site comply with that or that? Because that's mostly where we are running up against uh, uh, disagreements um, with strict wording. Um, so we generalized it more and made it more prompt-like. And then the last section, which we mostly all liked was uh, is recommendations um, for the planning commission and maybe other town um, public bodies and uh, and departments just about um, furthering solar for the most part, because I think that's something we all agreed on. Um, any yeah. organizations or anything like that? Did you pass along? Because I know there's a few. There could be. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. But uh, how, you said how long you've been on this now? You've been doing it. Well, we formed it back in uh, February, I think, after the January meeting. Okay. So February or March. Yeah. So um, yeah, we skipped a couple of meetings in uh okay. in the summer um, when we were stalled with the first draft. But, oh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, if there's no questions or anything about that, let's move on to the 6:30 item, um, discussing and hopefully deciding uh, the municipal planning grant. Um, staff provided us with some background documents. So how about, yep. So <clears throat> do you want to, Sue or Steve, um, give a little verbal summary to go along with that or, or intent or something? Um, sure, I, I can start. I, I don't, if, if you've all had a chance to read through these, I don't know that we need to, to dwell on it too much. We can answer questions. Um, but these were the three ideas that came up at the last meeting um, that you wanted a little bit more information on what it could look like. Um, we have not gone out to figure out how some how much something might cost, but um, 
have an idea of whether or not it's an achievable project, given the amount of funding in the planning grant program, as well as what we might be able to contribute from the department. Um, so I'll start with the bike ped master plan. I mean, this could go in a couple of different directions, but um, there is a strong link to the town plan and the needing to needing to create a master plan to kind of prioritize bicycle and pedestrian improvements. Um, one thing we talked about the last time was, you know, could it include transit? Um, and I realized I did not really get into that with this. I think that we could look at transit particularly in terms of stops, um, bus stops and, and wayfinding for the transit system. Um, it, we definitely wouldn't be able to be looking at routes and, and making improvements to the headway times and, and whatnot. But um, I think that it could, I think it was Steve, um, Steve, I think it was you that today was saying that, you know, incorporating some aspect of transit in it um, can make it an accessible plan for more people. So, um, yeah. so yeah. I mean, I'm happy to take questions on this one, or we can can go through the others and kind of discuss it. Um, there is the Brattleboro Coalition of Active Transportation has been doing some work on this. I think it would support the work that they've been doing, um, getting designations for the town, as well as the survey work that they've done, which um, Gary, I think you alluded to in the beginning of the meeting. Um, it's, you know, not necessarily a statewide priority for projects this year, um, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a standard planning master plan project um, that would benefit the town. I was wondering, was the traffic safety committee part of this also, or is this input, or did they input anything also or add to this? So. They did not. Um, I do sit on the traffic safety committee, I, so I'm, I'm familiar with the wide range of um, concerns that are expressed um, for pedestrians and bicyclists and vehicles, so uh, they were not involved um, with what I created here. Um, there, haven't, there haven't really been discussions. I, I, for instance, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't recall discussions of uh, a bike ped master plan at traffic safety committee, um, other than, you know, we acknowledge that we don't have one and it would be useful. Yes, I don't recall anything more than, than that at traffic safety. Um, Steve, do you okay. wanna give an overview of the other two? Uh, Steve worked on these, so. Sure. Um, so the infill housing plan fits very readily into the existing town plan goals. Uh, it's also something that would definitely satisfy state level goals. Um, and so for that reason, it would score highly um, in, in that matrix. Um, what we could likely do with an infill housing plan in particular uh, would be to identify the very granular uh, site-specific conditions that allow for infill, uh, as well as identifying potential barriers to different types of infill housing. Uh, and that would let us get very specific to infill housing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's definitely something we've had success with uh, reducing barriers recently through the recent updates to the zoning ordinance. Um, so this would allow us to get into even further detail to potentially understand uh, if we're not getting housing starts of a particular type, what might be the holdup on that, be it um, institutional barrier or a financing issue or a lack of builders, uh, we could really be holistic with that. And so for the climate change adaptation plan, um, this seems to dovetail very well with our hazard mitigation plan, um, which I understand, Tom, you've recently gone through the HMP. And, um, for that reason, you were potentially thinking that this is um, something that would be more useful to do along with the HMP next time that we work on that rather than oh, perhaps, pursuing yeah. that now. I don't want to mischaracterize that. No, that's, yeah, but I'll speak to that. 
when, okay. when you're done. Uh, so this was a fairly cutting edge planning topic. And so that could be quite interesting to the state, but I think that it does sort of fall outside of the town plan, uh, which I know Sue and I both agreed that that uh, is a little bit of shortcoming of the existing plan. Uh, and for, for that reason, we should definitely work on incorporating adaptation into future efforts. Um, and there have been a few recently um, climate adaptation plans in the state, um, notably uh, the town of Hartford just tabled one in their select board, but uh, they did contract out this particular company from Minnesota to uh, work on one of those. A lot of indigenous tribes have worked on these as a way to preserve cultural values through their connection to the landscape, um, which was quite an interesting perspective to pick up. Um, so there could potentially be bridges to work with the local Abenaki um, in, in creating that. But uh, because of the lack of competitiveness compared to the other two options, this would probably be a good idea to incorporate into the hazard mitigation plan in the future. Uh, although it would definitely be worthy of pursuing if that was the way that folks wanted to move. Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to um, start us off? Any commissioners, I mean, with anything at all? Input, position, questions? If I could ask a question of uh, the staff, uh, in general, um, would you say that one of these rises to the top in terms of the, um, and I'm not asking for a recommendation, but but is there sort of a scale where they fit the $22,000 uh, grant available? Uh, I, I, I got the indication, for example, from the, you know, the, the one, the chain, the climate change uh, plan that uh, it, it's, you know, in competitiveness, it says it would need to be feasible at $22,000. I don't know if that, if that's saying it is or isn't. Um, I guess yeah, I, I can, I can talk be nice a little to, bit. Go ahead, Steve. I mean, it would be nice to say that they're all equally feasible or not, you know what I mean? If one is like really not a good candidate on that basis alone. Um, I have concerns about the climate adaptation plan. I've seen, you know, some of those planning efforts can be multiple years, um, bringing in experts and, and that kind of thing. So um, I think that that one could be challenging. We didn't, we didn't go out to any firms to kind of see what the cost might be. There might be something we could pick off with it. Um, that's probably the one I'm least comfortable with. I think the one I'm most comfortable fitting in would be the bike ped master plan. Um, we could always work with the regional planning commission um, who is usually quite cost effective um, for some aspects of the plan, or we could put it out to for an RFP um, and possibly, you know, there, there might be a consultant firm that could come in under 22. I, I think it, it, it depends. Um, you know, the consultant community in, in Vermont, usually you can find somebody that can work within that level, but usually it's a little scaled back on the plan. So, but I think the Wyndham Regional Commission, we, we could have conversations with them and it would be feasible. And they've got really strong mapping and they've done, you know, regional bike ped plans in the past. So um, I'd be confident with their work. Um, and then the infill, um, you know, that that's more of an innovative plan. So I think it depends on what kind of professionals we needed to bring in on on that project. But it but it's doable partly because the planning staff would be able to handle more of that based on what's going on already. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well. Yes, I mean, we could handle some of it. I think that some of the design work that we'd hope to see would, would require other professionals. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to hey. add something if it was okay. Um, yeah, I see your hand up, sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was just, I went, am really interested in the infill housing plan. I think I, I read it through several times and I it sounds really interesting to me and I'd like to just kind of offer you know, myself and my experience and my, like, like just thinking about, you know, builders and other people that would be really interested in that 
in that plan um because we were just you know we were talking about this before the lack of inventory is you know part of the housing crisis that i think needs to be immediately addressed and that sounds like a plan that is you know really working towards that and i think i think we could get you know a lot of people would be behind it as well you know i think it'd be a very popular choice because it's in dire need it improves the property values of the, of the, you know folks around you know and um of of, of um property owners in town and um uh you, you know a lot, another issue that i see a lot in in real estate in in our area is the age of inventory you know the oldness of these homes that a lot of times yes they're available but require a lot of capital and a lot of manpower to make them efficient or safe and so just the idea of some new inventory, you know, new warehouses that are safe and good and, and um, you know, repurposed in zoning that, you know, we need. Um, I'm just, I feel passionate about it. I, I like it a lot and anything I can, you know, do to help with that part of it. I want to offer my, my services and uh, um, experience in it. Prudence. On the housing infill plan, I know there's another grant um, that will be coming up soon that we can apply um, for. Can you just explain, is there no overlap between the municipal planning grant and, and this other pot of money that, that we expect to apply for? It's a question for Sue. Yeah, I'm going to try to answer it without my dog barking in the background. So I might get up and um, just close the door. Hold on a second. <laughs> okay, sorry. He's a mini schnauzer and he's quite barky. <laughs> um, so um, I don't have the full details of the bylaw modernization grant. Um, part of it is to um, make improvements to the land use regulations. So I do think that there are probably some steps that um, you know we could weave into that grant or or do as part of it so that we could calibrate our regulations correctly. Um, so you know some of the work from the infill housing plan I think could. Um, could be done under the bylaw modernization grant to help us get to a place where we have the right regulations in place. I don't think all of it could. Some of the, you know, conceptual, you know, trying to, to um, you know, have a, um, you know, some of the architectural and site, kind of site plan layouts. I don't think the detail wouldn't be the same, but, you know, we could conceptually do it and then um, have that inform the regulations that we write as part of the bylaw modernization grant. You want to say anything there right at this point? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm like absorbing this, digesting, trying to get some thoughts on it. Hmm. Uh, I, I figure maybe we'll we'll bounce around yeah. a couple or a few times before we start, you know, before we entertain the idea of getting to a vote. Um, <clears throat> So I'm trying to speak less, to not speak too much. Um, so I'll just say that um, this at this point, it seems like we're kind of, or at least my perspective is that, um, yeah, last time I think maybe it seemed like I was more interested in the climate adaptation plan. I you know, kind of came up with that idea um, based off what I heard from Dan of um, Tropical Storm Irene. And, um, but since then, as Steve was alluding to, I. I review the uh, hazard mitigation plan that the administration, I think mainly or entirely has you know, revised recently. And um, I think it seems like there'd be a lot of overlap with that, you know, focusing on the increase in heavy rain events and flooding, um, et cetera. Um, and so, and then if some of the example climate adaptation plans that staff provided also just um, weren't adaptation, they were, you know, mitigation as well, as far as like reducing greenhouse gases and and dealing with uh, energy better, energy production and use. And so that seems, although the planning commission can do that, I believe state statute says we can plan and do various things with renewable energy. I mean, we have an energy committee in town 
So for those two reasons, um, I'm not really considering personally that one anymore. So it comes down to the bike edge and the housing infill for me. Um, I'm gonna hold off on where I'm leaning on those two right now and maybe see if other people want input or if, if you know, anyone wants to speak to the climate adaptation plan at this point. Because maybe maybe our, our discussion will be easier if we can rule out one of them and just bring it down to one versus one. So you want to just revisit this another time or just the just, climate adaptation plan? Yeah, I'll just have this. Well, I think I, I mean per, this is just me. I mean, right. you know, I'm, I'm, I've won equal vote like everyone else, but um, uh, I did. I didn't even think to what C, what Staff was saying, what Steve was saying about um, you know, keeping the, that that theme in mind, climate adaptation and, and folding it into the next hazard mitigation plan more so, mm -hmm. and also our, our town plan as a whole. Um, so I, I feel like that's a better place for it as far as the planning commission's purview. That's just me, but I certainly don't wanna mm. um, override over anyone's opinion. Maybe maybe someone wants to advocate for the climate adaptation plan at this point or? So this is incorporated with that 22,000 as well? Is this a whole separate? Well, we have the choice of, you know, picking between these three oh. themes for what um, for the grant we're going to apply for. Well, I guess, like you said, where we're, I guess, you know, where we're at with the climate change adaptation, is that something that is way off? Or is this something that's obtainable now or to could deal with now? Or because like you said, with the bike tech master plan, this is already something that's been tabled as pretty much you know lively right now and then we can entertain this uh today to make a choice on this because this is something i guess we could wrap up and then this can be as you said down mm -hmm. you know because i i see what you're saying on this because this is something that's more attainable right now that we should do yeah more realistic um yeah, I don't know if realistic is, um, I don't know, it, it depends on everyone's perspective. Like, do we, uh, you know, uh, do we go for the one that's most pressing or most, you know, most likely to uh, win the grant and check off the boxes or most likely to, right. you know, something that people have been trying to achieve for years? Is that the priority? You know, it's, it's, it's all of our different. Right. I mean, that's why I'm looking at the transportation aspect, because this is something more I'm not saying this realistic, but something that we've been really pressing to get to, yeah. as long as with this, with the climate change and with the energy committee also involved with this. Um, I personally think the bike pen master plan would be something we should move forward. Yeah. Thoughts? Prudence? Um, I think everyone knows that I'm a big advocate for the bike. Um, walk master plan and you know i think assuming that we're not moving you know the climate there's not an advocate for the climate i think we have two really good choices here and that's great they're both mm -hmm. you know they're both really important so i'll go i mean i can just speak for a couple of reasons that i think bike ped that i'm hoping bike ped will get it um so you know it helps all users um, of the brattleboro roads and streets you know from families getting their kids to school to senior citizens wheelchair users. Um, and then um, if we can include transit in the way that Sue talked about it with bus stops, it would include that as well. Um, it promotes physical act to the extent that we can improve our, um, our infrastructure, it promotes physical activity. I think it addresses health equity because um, low income neighborhoods need, you know, they, they need attention to their sidewalks. Um, as well, you know, all the sidewalks and often the ones in low income neighborhoods are in the worst shape. Um, people who can't afford a car need other, way, other ways to get around safely. Um, I think there's the environmental piece of reducing greenhouse gases if people are driving less. Um, and then the, it's expensive work. The infrastructure itself is costly. So it really requires municipal leadership and involvement. Um, and I, I guess, um, you know, I've, I've been doing this advocacy. This is year seven. Now I started it when I was the director of the health department 
and um, some things are happening and, and the planning department's been supportive and, and I don't wanna say like nothing's happening. Certainly the, the scoping study for the uh, bike lanes and route nine Western Avenue is really important. And there's been some other things too, but um, it's complicated stuff. And in order to really keep town officials accountable, um, these plans are, are, are just very, very helpful. And there was a B, some BCAP members met with Peter Elwell recently, and he agreed that these master plans are an excellent, you know, and, and necessary tool. He wasn't vote, you know, he doesn't have an opinion about, I'm not saying that he supports this over other things, because that's absolutely, I have no idea. But um, so I, I guess that's my last point is just that the, these projects take a long time. So this doesn't feel like as compelling right now. But the problem is, is we've got to get started because these projects just take so long. And if we don't get more of a head of steam going, um, I feel like we'll be in the same place, you know, five years from now where we're, you know, just doing a lot of wheel spinning, to be honest. Yeah, thank you, Prudence. I saw, I see the Kate's hand, but Dan had his hand up right after Prudence or during Prudence. So. No, you know what? I, I yield. Uh, go right ahead, Kate. <laughs> no problem. Well, you know, I was kind of thinking while Prudence was talking and, um, you know, going back over the infill um, housing plan, you know, I feels like the bike ped could is is the kind of plan that could the grant would we would get the grant and it needs the money, you know, while I'm looking at the infill housing plan, it seems like it's a lot of like identifying and reaching out to um, landowners and like education and working with the zoning. So maybe that's something we could still pursue that. And I would love to like help pursue that in, in donate, you know, using my time and, and energy and resources to do that without, we don't need like money to do that. You know, we could start maybe another committee that just focuses on, on doing those things, identifying the lots and reaching out to landowners and seeing what we can do that way versus, you know, the bike ped, like Prudence was saying, it's been, it's really needed and it will really, really help a lot of people and create more equity and you know Brattleboro being more accessible I think is a really important thing to focus on. Hmm. Well should staff jump in and and if I heard that correctly can can you guys verify if we can do both if staff can take that on or not I mean in, in, in tandem with you know some commissioners. Yeah I mean I think if it becomes a project of the planning commission yeah I think that's something that we can give attention to and and I think um, you know would would go along well with the bylaw modernization grant that we do intend to um, apply for so yeah. Mm. Hmm. Interesting well before before hearing that strategy by Kate and then verification by by Sue. I was going to advocate for housing infill, but if we can do both. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I'll just speak briefly to that. I don't know if it'll change anything because, um, but I was going to say how at, at last meeting, you know, I think I shared that my opinion was that, um, uh, um, yeah, my opinion was that we, we just did a housing action plan and, we're, and we have this, um, housing themed bylaw modernization coming up. So why focus on housing for this one? Um, but then my thinking changed a little bit and evolved. And I was thinking how, you know, with some other plans in the past, um, things haven't necessarily uh, led to much implementation. Um, I think previous commissioners, there was one or two before most of your, your time here. I can recall them kind of, uh, griping or feeling frustrated about like all we do is plans and yeah i mean we're the planning commission we're not the actual property developers or the you know the the, the town departments um but it seems to me we can do some things that are quasi you know actual implementation which i did like how in this housing infill it had like especially i think in the last sentence where it kind of summarizes it, it says that this that this plan um could precipitate new housing starts that otherwise would not have coalesced. And so meaning that, you know, it, it's, that's the part that intrigues me the most. And, you know, I find compelling the most, which is that 
this work could um, directly help people and educate them in, in finding opportunities to create more and different housing. Whereas, you know, the housing action plan is just, you know, advice and, and you know, ideas for strategies. The bike head master plan is just a starting point. The downtown design plan is just a starting point. Um, and then later the housing, um, the, the, the housing theme bylaw modernization is another way that we can take action within the planning commission's kind of purview, which is um, changing the regulations uh, and improving them. So what I kind of see is that the housing theme right now seems to be the biggest uh, priority. Yes, at the state level, and I don't necessarily just want to follow whatever priority comes mm -hmm. from Montpelier, but I think that's echoed in our town. Mm -hmm. um, I see it all over Brattleboro's Facebook page and you know, news articles and just what people say about the rental prices. And, you know, I mean, the house behind me just sold for three and a half times, two and a half times what it, what it was bought for a couple of years ago, right? three or four years ago. And um, yeah, the inventory is low. So it's just, yeah, it was bad before COVID and it's way worse now. Um, so I feel like to the extent that plans um, sometimes don't go anywhere. Like people don't buy into them. They don't get implemented. They kind of just collect dust on a shelf. I think it's to, to try to not let that happen to what we've already started with the housing action plan. We can kind of surf this wave of popularity. Ooh. I think it's very timely and topical to do as much as we can with housing while everybody, while a lot of people, the majority of people may become are thinking and caring about it. Um, but if we can take it on throughout without using the municipal planning grant, then great, we can do both. Okay. But, it, but if that's not true, then I think my, my vote is still for the housing infill implementation plan, right. if I can rename it. But I was thinking too also, Terry, yeah. yeah, that with the information that we have was just in the paper about the new refugees. I don't know if you're familiar with that, that are coming in too as well. This is also something that can be also helpful incorporated to the people with the influx yeah. that we're having. Um, I don't know, Sue, Sue, have you spoken to those people yet, the, the, that committee that was here? And I'm sure they're going to be interested in being a part of this plan. Like I said, this is you're definitely right time to get the hammer on the nail. Mm -hmm. This is very important now with the housing issues. Um, but, you know, that being said, that ball has already been rolling. So I guess this is also helping it to more a little faster, knowing mm -hmm. that uh, we're having all this influx and housing and people moving up here, as Katie said. So I think this is something that's also should be put out there in a also be uh, presented and voted on as well also. All right. A couple of quick things, just because I, as Gary was talking, I, I was listening, but I was also <laughs> realizing a couple of brief things I didn't say, which is that I would be happy with either. If, mm -hmm. you know, as Prudence said in the beginning, I think, you know, the bike head master plan is needed um, as well as the housing infill. And that um, I guess I would have the question similar to Kate had, mm -hmm. but on the flip side, can staff and certain interested commissioners take on a bike ped master plan? Or is that too, too out of our uh, wheel park, <laughs> wheelhouse? <laughs> is that in the graph, the pie? Sue, can you speak to that? Sue's thinking. Um, well, I wanna go back to the housing infill one first and just say, if it's taken on as a planning commission project, then yes, we can help it. If the expectation for either one of the projects would be the planning department is doing it, then I need to kind of step back and say, we don't you know, necessarily have, uh, necessarily can do it all right now. Um, but if, if it's you know, part of the planning commission's work at the monthly meetings, or if there's you know, a, a subcommittee or, or something like that that we're working on, then yeah, I mean, I feel a little bit on the spot with both of them um, and would probably, you know, need some time over the next month to figure out how the project would move forward. But I would say, yeah, probably with the bike pad, I think we're still going to need to hire out. We don't have the mapping capabilities. Um, 
where with the housing infill, we're probably, you know, pulling down data that we have and maps that we have, where with a bike pad master plan, we'll probably be creating new um, maps and, and that kind of thing. So we would at least have to be spending, you know, having some resources with, spent with the Wyndham Regional Commission. Okay. Oh, well, I was just thinking, um, you know, I, I like the, um, just about the infill housing program, you know, just to me, it seems like it's more about um, educating and uh, outreach and um, kind of maybe putting forward more of like a proposal to um, mm -hmm. folks that would be the owners of these lots that could be, you know, seen as a developmental, a, a developed the lot um, and then it's you know from there you can kind of either make connections with people together to me that just seems more of like a networking kind of project and the, like you said the bike pet you know would have to be outsourced to someone um, else to kind of like head that um, yeah yeah <coughs> Uh, if I could just say, uh, just to follow up on a couple of points that have been made, uh, I think there's definitely a lot of overlap between all three of these, uh, but but I definitely think feasibility-wise, uh, the two that we're talking about now uh, seem most uh, fruitful. Um, and so, not to say that you know climate uh, uh, resiliency and adaptation won't be addressed in some other way, but these two, it seems like they have fundamental questions. And to me, um, that might be a way to judge both of them also, which is, you know, I, I compared and, and looked into, into both of these a little bit. Um, one of them, and one, one observation or one thing that we might want to think about is that infill as the key word here in the housing study is a very specific piece of the housing puzzle. And uh, if you didn't look at it, you really should. There was a link put into the uh, summary about the, uh, the Lucis uh, study, the land use conflict identification strategy, which I think actually made a very couple of very good points. I didn't read the whole thing, but I looked at the maps and so forth. One of them is transportation, that transportation is part of, you know, uh, understanding how or, well, first of all, why do you have an infill problem, right? Why have these lots not been developed? Uh, and if you were to develop them, what would be the impact on things like transportation, right? So, and there's a great map in there of routes to get to a, uh, a supermarket, if you looked at that one. And, you know, things like that, right? How would you, if you were to connect the dots in a neighborhood, um, how would people get to them? Many people would choose a bicycle. And therefore, you know, if these, if there were more density in some of these neighborhoods also, assuming that you'd build on empty lots that, you know, um, are available, uh, you'd have more focus on, let's say, fixing the potholes in the street, that kind of thing not just for cars, of course. Um, at the other end, uh, on the other, uh, the bike ped, uh, you know, fundamental questions, um, I think there are some really provocative questions that could be, you know, could be answered. But to Tom's point, I don't know how actionable some of them will be. It will be, you know, some of them will be sort of like, we've studied this, we know the facts, let's say we know the most dangerous intersections for bicyclists, or we know the, the streets that need to be fixed and for, for the sake of, you know, skinny tires and all that. Um, but will it lead to action? I don't know, you know, but, but having this, but I'm, I guess I'm leaning more toward the infill study because um, it will have a, a more holistic impact, I think, um, from a planning perspective um, and, and it would be very actionable. So that's just my input. Uh, I guess you can tell where I'm leaning with this, but I'm certainly open to the idea that, okay, the, the housing infill study could be done some other way or you know, the, the staff can, can take some of that on and therefore for a grant, the bike ped thing is a, is a better alternative. Uh, but that, that's probably the only 
that's that's the argument I'd like to hear if that were available from someone. Hmm. Kate, do you want to speak to that or or anything or, or whatever you had in mind, maybe? No, no, I'm I, I'm I'm good. I think I've said um, all I can hmm. say right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I see your hand still up. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, I'm just. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, no, like your no, little hand. The yellow oh, hand. My, oh, my reaction. Cartoon, hand yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> that happened last time too. I'm, I'm deducing that. Okay. Um. Yeah. Yeah. To Dan's last point, that's the way I feel too. I mean, if we can do both, then I'm all for it. But um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm feeling most compelled by by surfing this wave of housing interest and crisis um, and doing all we can. And especially it's a it's an implementation plan the way I read it, not just a plan plan, um, which I really like because um, yeah, I think people like seeing action, especially the longer they are on the planning commission. It might feel more rewarding to see actual tangible results. Um, however you define that. Um, I don't know. We could keep bouncing it around. We that, could. Um, this is definitely like a long term. I just wanted to add that I think it's um. You know, a lot of people have kind of floated that you know, the, oh, this is a bubble. This is going to burst. You know, this is not going to continue like this. And my, I don't have a crystal ball, but my my professional opinion is that it is not going to burst. You know, that there's so many factors, um, putting pressure on on us in our community and, and in terms of housing. Um, and I just see it as continuing to be like a, a topic. So yeah, if we can, you know, start to Im implement some, some things and that's somewhat relatively, you know, doable, reaching out to folks, looking at zoning plans, you know, looking at what's here and maybe seeing where, where there's a, a pocket where we could just be talking to some landowners and talk to some developers and Put them together, you know, maybe and that adds to more some more housing being built around here. So uh, that's my final mm. thought on it. Curtis, did you raise your hand quickly earlier? Or I know Gary's no, up now. I, but... Go ahead, Curtis. Oh, maybe it was Dan. Oh, Dan. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just wanted to add sort of on a, a flip side or on the other hand, sort of part of this decision for me anyway, is that, you know, cyclists and uh, especially people dependent on uh, two wheels rather than four, you know, there, there definitely is, uh, there's a, a sort of an equity uh, vulnerable population kind of angle to this, which, which I think we should consider in the sense that, you know, if we don't do something about, or if we don't contribute to um, understanding the, the problems of this, of that, of these, the set of problems, then who would, you know, but with the housing thing, you know, definitely you're dealing with landowners, you're dealing with, you know, um, folks with a variety of interests in the community, of course, and, and who can get things done, but uh, some of that will get done in some ways by virtue yeah, of the market, you know, essentially. And and so uh, I, I guess that's my, on the other hand, you know, argument would be that you definitely have sort of a, a, a need, a community need that we could fill you know, that might not be filled any other way by doing the bike ped thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm just gonna, I guess, just pretty much summarize myself and this, this that'll leave it at that. And then we can just, I guess, at whatever point you people yeah. can decide. Yeah, it would be good to try to make the decision soon. Because um, we're at, at the seven o'clock item. Yeah, I'm looking at this, I'm like, housing or bike? Bike ped. Like that. So I'm thinking, let's see, what, what's what's the biggest crisis right now? I'm saying, like I said, I'm split between this in Brattleboro, housing, a bike pet. Granted, a lot of people biking now. Bikes are people jumping on it. Housing seems to be a lot more of a crisis, not just in the town, but around even in all the, throughout the nation, getting housing. So I think with the housing and what Dan was saying, once that branches out, it's going to branch and spill over to this with the bike path. 
because once that people start, you know, getting more into like biking because people aren't going to have cars once they get a place or an apartment. People are being more now out there than I have. And I've noticed that I've asked a lot of people for rides, but they rather ride bikes. Mm -hmm. So people are now getting into more to the health kit. People are coming out and, and I'm seeing that. So I'm trying to get a percentage here. What is the most crucial thing that, that we can get or to do right now that needs to be attacked and addressed in the town of Brattleboro? And both of them are important, but housing seems to be the biggest, biggest issue, as we can see around town. So I don't know. I, I, I say info housing, but if we, I don't know if we can do both. I'm still kind of split, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know if we can do both, but like I said, I'm trying to get an idea of what, what direction yeah. we can do this. See Sue's hand up. So um, going back to that question, so there are components of the infill housing that we already have a decent grasp on and some of which I think are gonna come out of the housing study, um, which are the conditions you know, that detract. I mean, we know that there's a lot of outside forces that detract. We know that there's some zoning changes that you know we need to make in terms of the educational and outreach components we've actually had some conversations about that um and you know in terms of in identifying um areas you know where there might be infill opportunities um steve and our the intern that we had over the summer we're going to do some you know investigation of that we didn't get around to it but you know those are easy pieces that staff can can pick off. Um, and then I think that the other can get rolled into the bylaw modernization grant. So if we really want to try to go for everything, I think combination between the two grants and staff work, then you know, we can get at both of these um, topics. Um, you know, we're certainly not gonna we're gonna have recommendations out of the housing plan that's probably gonna result in some more work or some changes. And so we're looking forward to those. Um, housing isn't just gonna drop off the radar, um, mm -hmm. is what I would say. And there are so many forces still at play in outside forces in housing where with these, you know, bike and pedestrian improvements, you know, that, that pretty much is a combination of grant funding and town funding. And so having them documented um, is a real benefit um, when we're pursuing that funding. And yes, it's slow. And, you know, and unless we make changes in the way that we allocate our funds, um, it will be slow, but, um, but it would be valuable too. Yeah. So it, it, does it still stand, Stu? Um, Sue, what I heard earlier where you said, um, if we were to do the housing infill as a, uh, not as a, the MPG, but just through staff and planning commission time, it would, uh, it would um, make up the, the crux or the, the majority of, uh, you know, some meetings going forward, you know, the commissioners might have to consider yeah. them, you know, two of us to, to start doubling down on that and do some homework and form a subcommittee maybe and take on some extra role. Yeah, or, or have work sessions at the planning commission meeting. I mean, it's not, we haven't done that in quite a long time, but you know, at some point if we're all in a room together and we've got these maps and we're looking and we're identifying um, places, you know, that's, that's part of it as well. And um, mm -hmm. figuring yep. out what kind of outreach we want to do um, together. So more of like a work session. Okay. <clears throat> So anyone, I could come up with a proposed motion or way to vote or something. Does anyone want to take a stab at it though? If, if anyone feels like we're ready? Uh, is it a vote for one or the other or both? I, I, I don't I guess know. It, I guess it could be that way. We could go around and say, what, you know, what's your pick? What's your pick? What's your pick? Or uh, phrase it like uh, I move to accept or, you know, to, to, to apply for this theme. 
and then see who votes in favor. I don't know. I guess it doesn't I, matter. Yeah, I don't know. I was, I was going to say, yeah, I need to apply for the info housing plan or bike fit mass, but can you, I don't know if you can say both. You have to have one or the other. Uh, that's what I'm trying to get an idea. Of yeah, motions you. always have I or nay or abstain. Oh, I don't know. I okay. mean, I think they do. Maybe they don't have to. Um, I guess I motion. Well, no, Dan, go ahead. You're hold, hold on one second. Um, I, I would actually like to round off the conversation a little bit uh, with by asking Prudence to 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 kind of give her uh, her pitch, uh, I guess, uh, for the the bike ped. I, I think you're essentially the sponsor of this, right? Just to have a, a chance to speaking to it. Yes, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess, you know, I hear the concern about, um, you know, another plan and, and having, you know, having things sit on the, on the shelf. I think, um, that there's, I think there's a lot of support for improvement, um, in, of our sidewalks, crosswalks, crossing the road, cross, uh, crosswalks, um, and, and also creation of bike lanes so that people can feel safe biking, um, so I think there's a lot of support for it in town, a lot of interest. And, um, and there's, you know, effect, there's groups that exist to advocate for it. So I, I really don't think that, that it's going to be, you know, this plan that just like, oh, that was nice, but none of it ever happened. Um, because it feels, you know, it feels compelling. Um, so I do think that we'll see implementation. Um, and I, I want to emphasize too, it is it is about walking as well as biking. Um, and you know the, the cyclists are hurt pretty frequently and sometimes seriously on our roads. Um, we we've had um, more pedestrian deaths actually than than we have cycling deaths. Um, but I don't you know I don't want to repeat what I said before. Um, so I don't know if that if that is what you were looking for, Dan. Oh, that's great. No, I, I just sort of wanted to have a chance to, to uh, put a, put a, uh, put a period on, or a, a pin in the conversation. <laughs> I could say that if we, if we were to vote today, I feel pretty strongly that I would vote for the bike ped. Like, I feel that makes a lot of sense. That's it, you know, if, if we were to vote, that's what I would vote for. And why? What can I can I ask you why? Um, because of the accessibility part, uh, I just think it's so important now, especially during COVID, that we are making as much effort as we can to create more equity, and that starts with accessibility. And I think the housing, the infill housing, is something we could do um, in tandem. And, and, and start working on more. Uh, whereas, you know, as Prudence said, they've been trying to push this through for a few years and people really need it. And it's, and it's more, it's for, you know, it's for everybody. It's for elderly, it's for, you know, young parents with young children, um, uh, people with handicap, you know, they, if they're in a wheelchair or they need a walker, you know, right? The way things are, um, it's not very accessible for that. And that's a huge amount of our population. You know, that's, it's really is affecting, I think more than, than the, my, it's not the minority. I really think it's the majority actually in many ways. How about we do this? Can, can we get a temperature check? Thumbs up means you're ready to vote. Thumbs down means you wanna keep, keep beating it around or put it off to another meeting? I guess I need a real hard to sell off, you know? A real what? Well, because housing is important and, and the bike is important. So to get a hard sell, to make, sell me, oh. to make me say, yeah, you know, I don't really feel comfortable right now to really make either choice because they're both important. Yeah. And for me to say, yeah, one's better than the other because housing, as we know in this town is very important. All things considered, people in hotels and all that. But then again, the bike pet master plan is important because I see the way the sidewalks are, people, accessibility, ADA, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. So the question is having one go before the other and not see the other being, you know, implemented like Proven said and being, you know, tackled and making sure this is being done. The question is, okay. I do this, can I live with myself? If I do this, can I live with myself? 
you know, knowing that these people in hotels, you know what I mean, Dan? And these people coming in, uh, this money's not going to last forever. They're going to need somewhere to go. Then again, we get to the bike pen, master plan. Okay, we build all these roads. I look back and these people would be sitting on the roads homeless that we built. Well, you know, the fact of the matter is, though, with the infill plan, it's not building housing for the folks that are in the hotels. You know, that it will be, it will create more housing, but it's not addressing that emergency need. You know, in a sense, it, in it a might sense, be a ripple I, I effect or a trickle down effect, but it's going to take years. Right. Sure, not direct. Yeah. Yeah. Some of it will be. Right. How about Steve? Just going to offer something that might um, soothe Gary's conscience a bit, I suppose. Um, I do think they're both great options. Yeah. One thing that does contribute substantially to housing costs, uh, for those of you who are concerned about the equity issue and the immediacy uh, when talking about the bike ped plan, is transportation costs. Uh, there was a study a few years ago that said that Houston was actually more expensive to live in for most people than Manhattan because of having to drive. Hmm. Right. Uh, and so by improving the facilities for uh, biking and walking, as well as potentially looking it into transit as folks have potentially had interest in, uh, you could potentially get people to not need a car and then therefore save a lot of income. And, and genuinely change people's lives that way, as well as potentially save lives by improving safety. Hmm. Um, so that could potentially be a, a very immediate um, equity need as well, if that helps to make them, uh, well, that probably makes the conversation even more difficult. So maybe yeah. I should. <laughs> but, uh, I just think we should have more discussion, that's me. Well, we did this last month. We had a whole month to think about it. <laughs> I mean, we could. Like, uh, how about, I mean, uh, can we do the temperature check? If people are ready to vote, it's thumbs up. And we can discuss after. And if you're not ready to vote, thumbs down. I gotcha. So all three are up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abstain from voting unless I need to break the tie. Um, I'm going to have a thumbs up. Okay. I, I just feel comfortable knowing that yeah. I have these. But, both, the both of important seats, yeah. but figuring out which one I would think at this time would be more, not just tangible, but in need at this time that we really, really, really need. And it's hard to think that they're both important, yeah. you know, and I don't want to make that wrong choice, you know? Yeah. But so maybe someone can propose this, a strategy going forward, not just which one we pick, but, but what we're going to do with both of these mm. and then we'll vote aye or nay. But Dan's hand was up. Well, if I could just say that, you know, to, to Gary's uh, concern, I don't think any of our votes reflect how important we think these issues are in relation to each other, right? We're not, set, the vote doesn't mean we're saying one is more important than the other, right? And so Gary, I, I mean, specifically, you know, for this grant, what is the right project? That's the question, mm -hmm. right? And uh, there are other activities going on in both areas, really. So, you know, we have whole organizations involved with bike ped, and of course there's planning commission and, and realtors and, and, you know, folks involved in the housing, you know, uh, field. So, uh, so there's lots of activity going on in both areas. Uh, which one can this grant contribute to the best or most, you know, or make a co contribution is kind of the question, I think. How much was the grant money? Twenty-two thousand, and we can we can add a little bit to so it. So that'd be bike pet. <laughs> I can tell you that I would have to go with the bike pet mask because housing is big. Shall we? Shall we vote? Someone want to phrase it? I vote that we move to move ahead with the bike pet master plan. Yeah, well, the vote. Second. Vote first. <laughs> oh. Could I, I wanted to propose an yep. amendment. Oh, well, I guess we have to second it first. I second it. Okay. Was there a discussion or an amendment? Prudence? Um, could we also amend the, um, the motion to 
um, to, to talk about the planning commission taking on the infill um, plan um, as a project. It's, I'm hesitating because it doesn't, it seems like the timing isn't quite right and that it makes more sense as once the um, study is done, you know, the study project. So maybe it could be worded more um, that the planning commission um, has, you know, keen interest in the infill um, project and um, uh, we'll, cons we'll consider it um, as the housing, when, when uh, housing, study is completed. Sorry, does that make sense? Yeah, I guess Dan had the discussion. Well, do you have to approve the amendment? I, I approve, I definitely approve the amendment. I don't have, yeah. we don't have Lauren Crisp here to, to do the, to do the perfect the, Roberts rules for us, so I'm rule. trying my best. Charter. What do we do now? Do, uh, more discussion or uh, what? I guess Dan, you wanted to say something to that? uh well so so we're voting i i thought we so we're voting yes or no on the bike ped being the top choice is that correct as well as an amendment that and then the amendment the, yeah. yeah understood i i i'm not sure if we you know uh uh hmm i i'm not sure if we uh uh you know, sh should phrase it that way, I guess is my concern, or uh, how, how should a vote like this be phrased? It, should it be pro or con on a certain choice or should it be um, for one of the three choices being the choice? You know, do, does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know, I think it could be either way. I think, I think someone just put forward that motion and, if, and it's kind of a, a strategy, it's a two part thing. And if people support it, then they can say aye. And if they don't, nay. And then we'll go back to the drawing table and come up with something else. Seems workable to me, but prudence. And, and just clarifying, so we would be the I vote if we if this passed, then that would be staff would be instructed to complete an application for the municipal planning grant focused on a bike ped master plan. Right? Is that everyone's understanding? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll go. Uh, start off with Dan. What's your vote? Aye. Prudence. Aye. Kate. Aye. Gary. Aye. I don't know why I said earlier I'd I'd abstain. You all know that people do that. So sometimes chairs do that. They only break ties. And I've never done that before, but I, I assume I can flip flop back and forth right, whenever yeah, I want. So um, I'll just stick with that. <laughs> but actually, no, I think we want to make it seem unanimous. So I'll vote aye too. <laughs> all right. Yeah. That has, more, that has more power and, and auspiciousness behind it. Um, and I, yeah, I like the strategy. I'm glad we can do both, at least somewhat. Could could we have that question clarified? Actually, is it okay to abstain and then be the tiebreaker, and only if you're the chair, or is that? Uh, yeah, not, well, not yeah. an option. I'm just curious. I just uh, right. We don't know. Well, I know I know that that some boards do it one way, some do it other ways. Yeah. But as far as the actual Final. rules that this planning commission has adopted. It doesn't say it in our rules of procedure or our bylaws. And I don't think we have officially, at least in my time, decided which version of Robert's rules we've chosen. We haven't chosen one. You know, there's the full unredacted one, and then there's the one for small boards. So, okay. retracting for. I can tell you, we definitely operate more under the small rules. Um, I can get an opinion of the town attorney. I don't know off the top of my head if you can abstain when you want to or. Yeah. <laughs> well, can you retract that? Yeah, that's, that's kind of funny. What I was just wondering, too, because that, I, I guess you could retract it if it wasn't finalized in a vote. He just mentioned that yeah. opinionated. I might think, or he just worded it, but it wasn't in a vote. Had it been in a vote, then 
it would have been finalized. Right. Well, we could, you know, if, if people feel uh, strongly, you know, we could revisit the rules of procedure or yeah. bylaws or wait until next year and and and, and put that in there on on, on, I, I on, on which way the chair should act. Email Bob right now. But <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Can we move on though to the next one? Sure. Are we are. Feel good about that? Okay. Um, we have this section 248 um, our, uh, agenda item, and I think staff is going to lead us mostly on that. It's supposed to end at 735. Maybe we can push it um, to, uh, you know, to 745, let's say. Um, is that enough time for you guys to do it justice, or what do you think? I think so. Um, I mean, I guess it depends. So... I had originally thought that the planning commission um, would need to make a decision and I can tell you why that is not the case anymore. Um, but I, I did want to bring this application before you because um, it was sent to you. Um, but I can kind of walk through the timelines. It was It's kind of a good instructional case and maybe a discussion of how we move forward with these in the future. Um, so, I will try to keep it um, brief. Um, and if you've had a chance to read through the materials, then um, you know I can probably keep it even a little bit briefer. Um, we did get the Section 248 application for a 500 kilowatt solar array off of Canal Street um, near Exit 1. Uh, for those of you that were on the Planning Commission late last year, this first came before the Planning Commission because they were seeking preferred solar siting, which is why there was the subcommittee set up. Um, the town and the, so the Planning Commission, the Select Board and the Wyndham Regional Commission agreed to um, that this could be a preferred site. We didn't have really any guidance at the time. Um, it was a difficult decision, um, but I think it was heavily based on the fact that we have zoned that particular property as industrial. And some people saw this as an industrial utility use. Um, so that was just one step that allowed this to be a bigger project. Um, but then they had to move forward with actually submitting the section 248 application for a certificate of public good. And so that's the step that we're in now. And um, that's a little bit different than local land use review. So um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of overview of that process um, and then just kind of walk you through the application um, and whatnot. So um, there are utility scale projects and including telecommunication cell towers um, are issued a certificate of public good by the public service board. So they don't come through the local land use permitting um, process and I should say with um, renewable or with energy projects um, and renewable energy projects in particular, if they are net metering, which means they're selling power back onto the grid, then they go through the 248 process. If somebody just wanted to stick up a wind turbine on their property and you know just power the property that way, then they would be subject to local land use review. So the Public Service Board is the board that's responsible for reviewing these applications. It's a three member board. They're quasi judicial, kind of like our DRB. They hear evidence, they issue orders. Um, you know, there's kind of a whole court procedure hearing or hearing procedure. Um, then there's the Department of Public Service, which is um, it's the representative for public interest in the state. So they um, they provide comments to the Public Service Board um, representing that public interest view. Um, so the process for the one that we're going to hear tonight um, is it's a full Section 248 uh, project. And so they basically they, they give us notice that in, you know, within 40 days, there's a 45 day advance notice where they have to say, hey, there's going to be an application coming. Um, and that's an opportunity for the town to, you know, ask for more information, maybe have a presentation, that kind of thing. Um, and then after that 45 days has elapsed, they can actually submit their full application, which is the stage that we're at now. Um, they submitted it on, I think, in the beginning of August. 
Um, and basically now the public service board will be looking at the application. They're um, looking at things, uh, natural environment, wetlands, shorelands, um, slopes. They're looking at aesthetics is a huge one, historic sites, cultural resources, public health and safety. And they're gonna be reviewing the proposal based on those aspects. Um, I mentioned that local zoning doesn't apply. So, um, you know, at the 248 level, if it's in that process, they don't really care what we say about it in zoning. They do care about what we say in the town plan. They'll give some consideration of uh, what the town plan has to say about the siting or the development. Um, so the town has a couple of different ways that we can participate in the 248 process. We can um, submit comments, we can intervene. Um, so those are two separate things. Um, or we can, you know, during that 45 day advanced period, we can have um, a public hearing where the developer can come and make a presentation before the town. Um, that's happened way in the past um, with the solar field that went up uh, near New Chapter. Um, and then everybody kind of walked away and said, yeah, this is great, we support it. Um, this one um, is now they have filed, um, so we missed the opportunity for a public hearing um, and, and doing that kind of thing. Um, it's been a while since we've had one of these, so that kind of did slip through the cracks. Um, we are in a comment period. We could send comments um, to the Public Service Board um, due to the timing of this, typically they've come for the plan before the planning commission and um, we review and if we've got any comments, we send it up to the select board and they can formalize the comments. Um, when I was going over the material, uh, the public service board wanted comments at the beginning of September. So the timing of this one, we didn't catch. It, it's a bit squirrely. So it was, you know, it's dated August 2nd. So it came in after our last planning commission meeting and the comments were August or they wanted it by September 1st. But I could reach out to the public service board if we've, if we've got comments that we wanna pass along. Um, and you know, I, I, how the public service board treats it from here, there's probably gonna be, we, we could, um, the, there'll probably be hearings. Um, so our comments would be, you know, in, could be included in that. If the town actually chose to intervene, then we would be um, part of the pre with part of the hearing conferences and, and whatnot. Um, so that's kind of the process and, and a little bit where we're at. Um, with the application itself, um, it is a, well, I can stop Tom, do you wanna take comments on the process or questions? Sure. Um, and yeah, in the beginning, you said that you thought maybe we would be taking a vote or an action, mm -hmm. but then you realize we have, we, there's not the opportunity and that, that's that period of time that slipped through the cracks. Yeah. You're saying? Okay. But we could submit comments. We could. Yeah, I don't know. I guess that, is that what you said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's maybe other people who haven't focused on the solar stuff, um, you know, like I and, and, and Doran have been on the <laughs> committee, you know, um, the, the subcommittee's work was focusing on the preferred siting incentive, but section 248, I kind of view that as, it's like a lower standard. It's like um, making sure that solar is acceptable and they check all sorts of things like Sue listed through, um, but it's kind of, it's like the baseline. Whereas preferred incentive is the um, like the upper echelon of of uh, standard, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if that was helpful. But yeah, I don't know. Any questions that people have pursue or comments or or ideas for com comments to submit about the exit one development? Still reading. <laughs> Dan. Yeah, I I apologize. I. Uh didn't actually I, I I skimmed over the the uh, 248 document but uh, partly because I wasn't seeing the specifics about this uh project and I I'm sure you went over this in January or whatever but can you just I guess two things who is 
proposing this or who is going to own this and what is what is the relationship with the uh with the grid is it a net metering situation is it what, what is the could you just sort of clarify those two things sure so um integrated solar is the applicant and it's my okay. understanding that they are going to operate it and just right. sell it to the grid um okay it is a net metered project it's 500 kilowatts Right. It's approximately the application said it's it's a total of 1740 solar modules on metal piers in 13 rows. So it's a it's a large solar array. Yep. Um, they're going to be clearing about two well about 2.3 acres of cleared land for the solar installation, the array itself. And then there's going to be additional clearing on the property. Another 4.8 um, acres will be cleared and kind of turned into meadowland. And then 1.3 acres for both parking and the driveway up to the site. Um, the driveway is going to be about, or the road will be 1,200 feet. So it's a it's a substantial development. Um, there's a wetland, a class two wetland on the site because it's a wetland that's it's, it's about 500 square feet, but it's associated with a stream. So it's categorized as a class two wetland. Um, there'll be some buffer requirements, but they are also proposing to fill a little bit mm -hmm. of the wetland um, due to the, it's gonna be impacted by the road construction that the, the road to get up to the array. Um, they've done a lot of aesthetic work. So part of these applications, um, is looking at the view shed um, where it's gonna be seen. It will be visible if you're traveling north on 91 for intermittent periods. Um, they've done a solar glare analysis um, and it will not have a glare impact. Um, and they looked at a couple of different places. I think some up on John Sites Drive, which is in the exit one industrial park. They looked on 91 and I think there may have been another location. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that this is, we've zoned the land industrial. Um, so we were anticipating that was that whatever was going to be developed on it would could be intense. Um, this is, you know, potentially less intense than some of the other industrial development, but the land clearing might be more than what we would have seen under another industrial development. Um, but it's certainly less noise um, and, Hopefully it's got a good environmental impact. It's intended to. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of overview. If you Great, want thanks. I, I do remember the name of the owner now. It's coming back to me, but I, I know I didn't see the original plan and all that. But, um, thanks. Yep. Yeah, Gary, something about what's this? Well, no, I did, like I said, I just came into this because you guys have been on this, what's this, January? It was discussed oh, this, oh, then. Yeah, okay. So that's what I'm just trying to get some catch up <laughs> on this figure. Now, where is this located again? The exit? Right across from exit one industrial parks entrance. It's a hill. Mm -hmm. up, up on a canal? Isn't yeah, it? right after exit one. Past the outlet, right? Or Yeah, yep. and on the other side. Oh, okay. I just I was just going to check it out myself. I, did, I like to do site surveys. Yeah. <laughs> after like you the can't. First you can't really get up there. Yeah. Oh. It's pretty non it's nondescript right now. There might be a little pull-off area. Oh, you so could hike up in there. But... Okay. I, I was just curious to see how the setup, but they, do they have a I guess a map or how I was gonna look? Oh, yeah. I never got the map or anything, how it looked. Yeah. In the yeah. Google Drive. Oh, yeah. I, I thought it was all in the Google Drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all in there. Okay, it's in the Google Drive. It's okay. under the, um, if you go into this meeting, September 8th, there's the section 248 application and there's about eight pieces of the application. Uh, got it. That's how I'm sending it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do I go, I mean, being that I've never, I have to, this, this is new. And I wasn't there when it was presented or really, I don't know too much about it to really go get a decision. Well, you're just giving us background on the process, yeah. right? But if we yeah. wanted to submit comments, we could, if we were prepared to do so, we could go through staff who would do it. 
submitted for us? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And I think um, more, you know, maybe more moving forward, if we're going to see more of these applications, then we, we need to be, you know, it's kind of an educational experience for you. And then if you get familiar with the applications and the materials that they send, um, you know, we can be right. in a better position. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? What's, what, sure, Kate. I was just kind of wondering in, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm catching up on this too. In the application, are they, do they give a um, timeline or um, like an estimate of, uh, yeah, of, of like, you know, how long it's going to take or if there's going to be a lot of, if it's going to disrupt any, I don't know, traffic uh -huh. there? No, I didn't. Um, I didn't see any estimate on the amount of time it will take to construct or when it when they hope to be up and operational. Um, they did. They did address transportation. Let me just find that or traffic. Um, that is one of the criteria that they look at. Um, um, there'll be short term periodic traffic impacts from construction deliveries of project equipment. Um, they're going to use the public roads um, with vehicles that are common for such construction projects. Um, yeah, that's what they say. Let me see if I can find, yeah. So they're, they're not anticipating, they'll build a road, the road up into it, and then it's pretty, pretty much up into there. Oh, I see. Yeah. Roadway will be installed 1200 feet long for access. Yeah. Cool. My, my lens of thinking about this, this, uh, project here in town has been, you know, almost entirely through the preferred site. That's what I was alluding to earlier. And, um, you know, in, in, the, in that in that realm, I would have some comments or, um, you know, uh, un, unsatisfactory sort of observations about it. But like I was saying, Section 248, my interpretation of it is that it's a it's a lower bar. It's like a baseline threshold. Um, and uh, I haven't looked into that too much, but um, to compare with other projects. Um, but some of my concerns, and you know, maybe they could be reiterated again by, by us for the section 248, I don't know. But like I said, um, the preferred status is a higher status, but you know, even in our town plan, you know, it depends on which quote you pick, right? But um, it says to encourage intensive industrial pro uh, projects in existing industrial parks. Right, solar field doesn't seem like an intensive industry in my mind, and I think the rationale for that is that, like, you know, um, um, uh, a plant or a factory or a menu, you know, um, like CNS or like the um, Fiber Mark or some things in Exit One, maybe they um, they contribute to the economy and the tax base and the workforce more than a solar plant does. So that that might be the rationale for that, and then also, you know, our plan certainly talks a lot about compact growth and efficient, um, compact and efficient development. So to me, this is one of the few types of development that can layer upon another. It can be on a roof, right? Or over a parking lot. So it doesn't seem in an ideal world, it doesn't seem efficient to me that this is now taking an industrial lot and just removing it from the possibility of being anything else um, for, for a while. So. That's that's the things that would make me personally not want to give it preferred incentive. Um, those are the main two, maybe, um, and clearing forest when there's other sites. Um, but as far as the kind of baseline section 248, is this acceptable? Um, I'd say yes, maybe more so. But I don't know if people felt really strongly about that. I, I'd want to, you know, push those comments. Um, to the section 248 period, but it's not it's not as relevant as it was for for during the preferred review. But just to give you all a little background perspective. 
thank you. I try. I try to be coherent. <laughs> that was just like Sometimes I help fail. people play catch up. Yeah, Prudence. You're on mute. Turn your uh, speaker Sorry. on. Sorry. Um, so back in January, did we vote for it to be preferred? Yeah. I thought so. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I think um, your comments, Tom. I kind of, I kind of agree with them. I think once you are submitting your application for the certificate of public good. You know, they've they've hired engineers. There's sound engineers. There's visual, you know, people that have put this application together, and it's it's pretty solid. I kind of agree that probably it's it's when we decided to give it preferred citing, um, that was you know perhaps more relevant. Um, right. It was reviewed by the planning commission. It was reviewed by the select board. Um, you know, this is dealing with site specific aspects um, of the development, kind of like the DRB would do. Um, but I'm, you know, it's, um, it's usually a pretty solid application at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so sometimes projects will come before us that didn't come before us for preferred site. And then, so that will be maybe a better time to comment. Unless, you know, a new commission or was to, you know, commission was to be revamped and the new members were to disagree with the previous commission's preferred site mm -hmm. choice, then maybe they could, uh, whatever, undermine, revolt, change, alter, that sort of thing through submitting comments. But anyway, I, I don't want to take up more time with my, was there more to this, Sue? I think, no. I think we should keep going if there was. No. Okay. Do you need a vote for this? No, no. Oh. To, to the section 248 section, you're done. Okay, great. Oh, yep, all done. Um, okay. Any other wrapping up comments or questions about it? I, I gotta do some more homework. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we have this uh, historic preservation um, item. Um, we don't have, you know, um, any public here for the comment period at 750. And and the last one, new business last agenda suggestions. Maybe we can, unless someone you know, was really pressing for, for an idea there. We could also kind of maybe use at that time for this historic one. Sure. Um, if that's agreeable, then uh, I think staff will start us off with this one as well. Yeah, so um, within the department and then also in our work with the design review committee, they are um, a committee that makes recommendations to either the zoning administrator or the development review board about um, development that is happening within our historic resource overlay district. So within Brattleboro, we have four districts that are on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and that's downtown Brattleboro, it's West Brattleboro Village Center, which is a smaller area than what you might think of um, the village center. Um, it's kind of in the South Street, Western Ave area. And then we've got Clark Canal um, Historic District and the Homestead Fort, and both of those are off of um, Canal Street. So in those, in those areas, we have special regulations that apply to them. And the Design Review Committee, which is a board of three people in one alternate with you know, some historic preservation and architectural background, they review that work. Um, and so, We've had that in place since 2015, 2016. And so, you know, maybe they hear four or five applications a year. Or so in the period of time working with them, we've got, we've had some historic preservation issues arise. So um, we had been looking, so, so tonight's purpose is really to just kind of give you an update on some projects that we're working on and things that will be moving forward in the, in the near future, hopefully. Um, the first is the Certified Local Government, um, which is a program. Um, actually, Steve, do you want to talk to this one? Because I know you've been working on it. We'll, we can keep it pretty brief because um, Prudence and Tom are probably um, might recall having been um, introduced to the Certified Local Government program. Um, but it's something that we're kind of actively moving forward at this point and hope to pursue um, in the next month or so. Um, Steve, do you want to speak a little bit about it? 
Sure. So the Certified Local Government Program is something run by the Department of the Interior and the National Park Service uh, in coordination with state historic preservation offices to uh, certify a local government as being um, appropriately able to handle state level funding for historic preservation. Mm -hmm. um, so it being subject to that higher standard allows you to be considered responsible enough as a local government to be given uh, part of 10% of the uh, annual budget that the State Historic Preservation Office is given. And so currently in Vermont, um, we've looked into the other communities that are doing it to see how they've done uh, their programs. There are, and now I've forgotten the number, I believe there are 17 communities right now that do it. Um, and so it's not just municipalities. There's one incorporated village that is a CLG, and there is one three-town region that is a CLG. Um, so there is some flexibility in that. Um, effectively, what you need to do is get your appropriate governing board, so in our case, the, uh, the select board, to approve moving towards that, um, which we don't believe would be a problem at all. Um, for us. And then you need to form a historic commission. Um, so we assume that the three members and possibly one alternate of our uh, DRC would be interested in joining. You have to have at least three and as many as nine members, um, according to the charter. And so we are going to um, put out some conversations most likely primarily with the Historic Commission. Um, the DRC? Uh, the DRC, but what, what's the word I'm looking for here? The the Historic Foundation, the people upstairs. Um, the historical, historical Society. Historical Society, <laughs> historical society. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we're going to ask them. There are some fairly high standards for professional qualifications for being able to serve on that board. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then you would need to also pass uh, an enabling ordinance for the, the board. And then you need to hold a meeting and let your state historic preservation office know that you've done that. Mm -hmm. And then they will start the ball rolling mm -hmm. on yeah. getting us um, certified with them and with the federal government, and then we can access a lot more money for historic preservation planning. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. uh, so it's actually a lot easier than we were thinking, uh, seemingly, to start the process. Um, and then we will find out just how easy it is as af after we get the ball rolling on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I guess I should mention the, the things we were hoping to primarily do with this um, is to create local districts that aren't um, necessarily National Register tied. Uh, we've, we've read some literature and had some discussions on how that can impact people's perception of historic preservation and equity issues, willingness to comply or to become a, a historic district, et cetera. We also were looking into demolition delay ordinance um, and we were thinking of potentially uh, including more design review um, in those local districts. I think that's everything. Um, if, if I missed anything, Sue. No, that's great. And those last points of what we're hoping the um, Historic Preservation Committee would do um, all relate to our land use regulations. So. Um, right now, as I, I think I had mentioned, we impose an additional regulatory review on these historic districts. Um, and we received some feedback from um, design review committee members, as well as uh, state historic preservation office that it's not ideal that the being on the national register should really be you know, something to be proud of, and it shouldn't come with what somebody might perceive to be a stick um, of this additional regulatory barrier. And then on top of that, there are some of our districts, both um, Clark Canal and Horton Homestead or Homestead Horton, um, were put on the National Register uh, by the Wind and Windsor Housing Trust um, for good reasons. They were looking for preservation tax credits and, and whatnot, but 
you know, so now we've basically said that these are really important areas of town, which the people didn't necessarily buy into at the time. Um, so they've got this designation and now they have special regulations. And um, not all of the buildings that are still in those districts have integrity left. And, and I say integrity, I'm using that in um, a preservation sense where uh, there may have been modifications over the time. And at the time of the listing, they were considered to be a contributing oh. building, but there was a whole period where there were no additional regulations on them. And so maybe there have been changes to the building that um, means it's it's not as intact as it was when it was listed in the 1980s or the 1990s. So by stepping back and um, going for local historic districts, districts and decoupling it from the National Register, we're hoping to um, find those neighborhoods where the property owners are willing to buy in and kind of preserve um, the cultural and architectural heritage of the, of the neighborhood and um, kind of start that process over again and figure out where where is it that the community says um, are these resources that we want to kind of maintain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions or input? Dan. So, so, so by overlaying uh, local districts with the national districts, uh, what uh, is there any regulatory baggage connecting the two, or are they disconnected? So, I, sorry, can you repeat that with so the does, local so district? In other words, with the local, uh, the new local historic preservation zones uh, mm -hmm. take precedent in some way over the national? That's our idea is that they will. I mean, it's going to require changes to the zoning. Um, but, you know, yes, you have that regulatory stick, so to speak. But there are also benefits, um, you know, with the certified local government, we can um, help, you know, there might be resources um, for those local historic districts. So we can tie it in a way that there's a carrot in the stick. Mm, um, but mostly it's just getting people to buy in and say, yes, we want this. We think we're a special neighborhood and or or it's, you know, another part of the community saying, you know, recognizing the, the local history. Right. And can I ask another question about that history of how they became uh, part of the <laughs> districts already? Were, were there significant historical features or was it things like, you know, there's a slate roof here and therefore it's historic? Or, you know, was, it, was, it, was it, you know what I mean? Was it, was it consequential stuff or was it kind of uh, tangential things that got them on the registry before? If I recall, and um, Tom, you can jump in um, sure. if you know more about your the district that you live in. I think it had Money to do right. with the context, the historic context, not so much a particular architectural okay. style or okay. um, so. Uh, you know, they were both kind of working class neighborhoods. Um, you know, the Canal Street School, which, you know, that has significant architectural history there, but the housing um, was pretty modest workforce housing. Um, mm -hmm. So it was more of the context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just say it, it was news to me hearing the, um, that the, that the major impetus for that neighborhood and the uh, Horton Homestead was um, Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust trying to get the, um, you know, uh, access to renovation tax credits. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll add in there that private property owners or owner occupied homes, like currently, I think there's no, there's no benefit to them, no mm. tax credit accessible. No so that's something to keep in mind. But mm. regarding the neighborhood, homes, home, uh, Horton Homestead seems similar, but um, the Clark Canal, Estabrook, Lawrence, a little bit of South Main um, district. Um, yeah, I think if I can recall what I read correctly, it's that it's very unique to have a um, such an old and well-preserved um, low-income working-class neighborhood to the you know to this day. Um, right, typically it's kind of some of the fancy mansions and uh, public buildings that are preserved because 
maybe this is just my opinion, but individually house by house in these two districts I listed, each house doesn't really have much that's notable. Mm. But altogether, just the fact that they still exist is one thing. And then two, this is this is my personal preference of what I think is great about it, is the homes are close together and the streets are narrow. Um, yeah, so so they're kind of unique neighborhoods. And you definitely hear that from people when they when they visit it the first time. They say, oh, this looks like I'm in some European you know, town. Um, just everything's so close and the streets are narrow. It's like it was designed before, for, before cars. <laughs> um, there's not much space for them. Some one-way roads as by necessity. Um, so this conversation is to, that we have here, this agenda item is to, um, like you said, just give a current status update and kind of discuss where we're moving forward, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess, I don't know, I have a couple ideas or things to share. Should I just go ahead? I'm the chair. <laughs> <Do it. laughs> I'm feeling tired. We should wrap this up. Um, I think I'd like to see the, um, the like a proposed ordinance that would be, you know, the, the first requirement. So if I can speak like. to that super briefly, sure. there, there is a sample um, ordinance that basically just has a bunch of blanks to fill in yeah. that the state offers uh, as, as a tool for helping uh, ease the process. And then there are also the full text ordinances of all 17 existing oh, okay. CLGs. Great. And so I've skimmed those a little bit. Um, yeah. But we could definitely look at all of them and okay. see has someone done this in a way that we think is worth replicating directly, or right. should we just take the sample one and, and do it, or make one from scratch? I mean, I mm -hmm. think that's those are all things that the planning commission can look at. All right. Okay. And then, and then my other thing, just to um, add a little bit of, of my perspective, or or maybe you know partially why this got put on the uh, on the agenda is that. I think a couple meetings ago or before that, you know, that's when I learned from staff about the history of um, the Clark Canal District, historic districts getting on the, um, um, becoming becoming one in the town regs. And, um, you know, I've lived there now for, for three, two and a half years or so, or three. And um, it just kind of struck me as odd that this low income working class neighborhood with not very special buildings individually is preserved and, you know, has some, some regulations, restrictions that go along with it. Um, supposedly, you know, presumably for the larger community's benefit, right? We preserve scenic areas and natural areas, historic resources and such. Um, and then I mentioned how private uh, owners, you know, who aren't renting you know, or have a commercial building, they don't have access to any um, benefits to, to, um, to balance out the restrictions. And then furthermore, it's just always been a low income neighborhood and it still is. So we get into the equity issues and we're putting restrictions. So, you know, it's, for example, you know, I hear in my neighborhood um, every so often like, oh, that darn slate roof, you know, it's a pain in the butt. Every year a slate falls down, I gotta hire somebody. And, you know, I have read that over the lifetime of a roof, a slate roof is the cheapest. I don't know if that's true or not, but for a lot of people who live, you know, who can't spread out their finances throughout their whole life and think like that. An asphalt shingle roof is more, more. Uh, well, a slate will last for. Over. Well, a slate will last forever if you replace yeah, right. one shingle right. at a time. It's the best roof you can get. Yeah. 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 So the, anyway, that's why I put into the um, into the folder for this um, uh, some examples. I think they were from like Connecticut and New Hampshire about how. In fact, some states have put it in their state law where a district can't be become a historic district without uh, a property owner buy-in, you know, a two-thirds vote. And then they can also opt out when they want through a two-thirds vote. We don't have anything like that. You know, we have planning commission meetings where the public can come. And then, um, you know, there's also some examples of like a real estate tax credit in return for, for, for you know, being restricted to benefit the larger community supposedly, and um, maybe zoning fee exemptions too. I think that was in one of them. So it's kind of an odd position, right? Because I live in this neighborhood and I'm, and I'm, I'm proposing these things. But um, you know, I also hear from the people in the neighborhood and have just kind of observed uh, what I think is kind of an imbalance. So 
So I don't know, we're starting the conversation or resuming it because CLG was brought up uh, in past a year or two ago. Um, but what would, what would be helpful? If we see the ordinance and we think about these things and <laughs> what, do, what do you all think? Uh, what? Yeah, so maybe this could be part of our, um, right, so if we're talking about housing, and it's probably you know, certainly not the biggest reason, um, but restrictions on the historic districts and homes could be a, a little piece of the pie that affects you know, housing renovations and adding more units and improving homes, adding new ones. Um, so it could be something that comes up for the housing infill work we do or the bylaw modernization grant or just you know, CLG work or how we frame the ordinance. Not that it's, I guess we could recommend to the select board how to frame the ordinance, but it's up to them. So land trust rights don't come to this either, is that right? Land trust rules? No, I don't think okay. so. Sure. Prudence? We would have to adopt the <clears throat> zoning regulations, right? We'd have yes. to, rec we'd be the first step for those. Yeah. This is interesting. It sounds like the next step is to um, approve, the select board has to approve pursuing this certified local government. Do it. Is that true? And then? Yeah, I mean, the land use regulations can happen outside the CLG. They're kind of related because it does bring extra resources um, to the town to do some historic preservation work. So we see it related. Um, but yeah, that's right. our first step is to do CLG and kind of begin figuring out how the local historic district district process with that. Right. And Steve yeah, and I have people. had conversations with people in various neighborhoods who, who seem to have an interest um, and there's a variety of economic um, status of the neighborhoods that but there seems to be some interest in a local historic district even knowing that it might come with regulations so i like the idea of maybe being able to vote in or and even opt out right yeah provides you know an avenue for more of the neighborhoods you know to to buy in and be enthusiastic or not but to, you know, to own the process. Um, yeah, so just to frame it a little bit and we're over time here, but yeah, I think the CLG um, process would provide more resources um, for, the, for historic preservation, but then also maybe we should be considering how our current land use regs uh, approach historic uh, regulations. Anyway, 806. Is there any final comments on that on the historic aspect or anything we need to say to wrap that up for now? No more to come. So there's just yeah, more, more this, is, this is sort of an update that things will go ahead. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. And if you have any thoughts, um, by all means, email Steve or myself. Okay, great. No public here. And uh, the agenda suggestions, new business was just a kind of for, a formality to, to say like, um, instead of, you know, Sue and I just forming the agenda in between meetings. Of course, anyone can come to us and, and, and uh, bounce ideas or propose things, but we'd also have an official time here for people to pitch ideas <laughs> and then, you know, do a temperature check of everyone and be like, all right, yeah, that's going to be on the next meeting. So if someone wants to do that real quick, but we're over time, but sure. I have one thing just to just to uh, hearken back to my original interest in the uh, impact of uh, tropical storm Irene. Sorry to harp on it, but uh, I, I I found a very interesting uh, uh, side story to this that I think it'd be interesting at some point to dig into. I don't know exactly how. Uh, the main thing is that uh, the combination of the financial crisis uh, in you know. 2008, 2009, uh, and Irene, uh, essentially, and this is, this is, uh, I don't have data on this, but this is basically, uh, 
it is apparently well known um, that uh, among among uh, people in the financial uh, sector um, that small business administration loans uh, and the uh, the banks that um, that approve that were that were connected to SBA to approve them started to skyrocket. Basically, now we have about ninety five percent of banks are able to do that and. Then it was about it was literally the the flip of that. It was about five percent. So since since that time period, and and in in Vermont, in our particular context, apparently right after two thousand eleven, it it shot up because they were disaster loans. So so I just want to uh, maybe think about the possibility of 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 you know I'm sure the banks the local banks essentially have a lot of interesting information about some of the development that happened because of those SBA loans. It's just a, just kind of a, an idea of one specific way to, to follow up, you know, what, what has the, my question was really, what has the impact of, of Irene been? And I, I understand a lot of that's been covered, you know, by other agencies, but it, it seems like the development aspect of it and the sort of the disaster preparedness aspects of it, I think had, were impacted by the SBA at this point. I, I had not known about this until I actually talked to someone at the SBA. I happened to be talking to someone about, at the SBA about, about um, small business loans. And um, yeah, the, it's a interesting historical feature of, of uh, what happened after Irene. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I was just thinking at some point that, that, that uh, you know that change. It would be interesting. I, I probably will end up talking to other people about it anyway. But uh, so I can, you know, share. But uh, it's um, it's uh, I think it's a concrete way to to look at some of the changes that happened since Irene. Just as a okay. yeah. Thanks. Anyway, anyway, thank you for listening. Okay. Yeah, no, 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 well, no, I, no, I just wanted to raise it because I don't want to lose that thread uh, on my own end of, you know, that there have been some, some real, you know, fundamental changes because of Irene. And obviously there are a lot of others, but that might be one that uh, we could think about. Absolutely. Um, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry for going over folks. I got a wave of tiredness about 20 or 30 minutes ago. We're here all night, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we didn't we didn't do our official rule of procedure promoting over the, the scheduled time. Sorry about that. Um, but are we good? I don't think we have any more business. So entertain a motion to adjourn. I motion we adjourn. Second. 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 You guys want to keep going? Okay. I heard prudence. Great. We're adjourned. Thanks, everyone.